morning, Jeeves. Good afternoon, sir. Cracky, is it noon already? Indeed it is, sir. And do I have anywhere to be this afternoon, Jeeves? I believe you have an engagement to the British Library at 5.30, sir. Do I? In that case, you'd better fix me one of those bracing pick-me-uppers of yours, Jeeves. I have one in readiness, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the world of Pelham Grenville Woodhouse. Show in Philly, Boston, and Baltimore. A chance for stage folks to say hello. Another opening of another show. Another job that you hope at last will make your future forget your past. Another pain where the ulcers grow. Another opening of another show. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the world of Pelham Grenville. Woodhouse. The overture is about to start. You cross your fingers and hold your heart. It's curtain time and away we go. Another opening of another opening of another. You're the top. You're the Colosseum. You're the top. You're the Louvre Museum. You're a melody from a symphony by Strauss. You're a Bendel Bonnet, a Shakespeare sonnet. You're Mickey Mouse. You're the Nile. You're the Tower of Pisa. You're the smile of the Mona Lisa. I'm a worthless check, a total wreck, a flop. But if baby I'm the bottom, you're the top. Now, having heard Cole Porter writing both music and lyrics, here's P.G. Woodhouse writing lyrics with Cole Porter for the 1935 London transfer of Anything Goes. You're the top. You're Mahatma Gandhi. You're the top. You're Napoleon Brandy. You're the green and gold and mauve of the old school tie. You're the Brothers Western, you're Harry Preston, you're custard pie. You're supreme. You're the gates of heaven. You're the cream from the Shire of Devon. I'm just in the way, as the French would say, the top. But if baby I'm the bottom, you're the top. Now, and finally, here is P.G. Woodhouse, that quintessential Englishman, writing lyrics for the great American composer, Jerome Kern, for the 1922 hit show, The Cabaret Girl. I used to hate the strife and din of London life. But my tastes lately have altered greatly. Yes, long past that day is, and now all I say is London brighter, London, save a place for me. You may make a note upon your cuff that I find London good enough. Remove all doubts of my approval. If there's room in London, well, put me anywhere. I prefer the Ritz, but failing that, I'll sleep against a railing, just so long as it's in London, I don't care. London's foggy, also dirty, and they close it at 12.30, but you'll find me right there. You may spread the information that I found my true vocation, and I found it right here. In London town! Simon Beck, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, the world of Pelham Grenell Woodhouse. Vikram Doraiswamy, Shashi Tharoor, Paul Kent. Hal, thank you so much. 
in conversation with Shrapani Basu, accompanied by Simon Beck. Can I please have all of you amazing actors on stage? Fantastic. I think that's... That's, uh, that's mine, that's mine. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm sitting on the brown one. <laughs> the range of things. That was fabulous. Absolutely. <laughs> Gosh, that was amazing. Thank you, Hal. Thank you. <laughs> it was just brilliant. And I believe, I was just told, that you have a quote, Vikram, about Pichu Woodhouse singing. <laughs> Yes, since, uh, I mean, Hal, uh, since Hal has just finished <laughs> singing, here's a good one to start us up. <laughs> In order to make a song a smash, it isn't enough for a singer to be on top of his form. The accompanist must do his bit. <laughs> yes. And the primary thing a singer expects from his accompanist is that he shall pay the accompanist to the song he is singing. So spot on there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's and a that's quote from, from the Lord masked Emsworth troubadour. Lord <laughs> Emsworth and others. Oh, well, it's lovely to be here, and what a cracking start. So we're going to have a lark, and no chucking of bread rolls, OK? <laughs> While I control this, all these members of the Drones Club, <laughs> and I am, I'll probably be Aunt Agatha today, so yeah, <laughs> expect a bit of, a bit of bossiness. <laughs> right. So, Hal, you know, most people know uh, P.G. Modhaus as the writer, <laughs> creator of Jeeves and Wooster, P. Smith. Not a lot of people know about his musical career. So tell us a little bit about that. He collaborated with Cole Porter, Anything Goes, Showboat. There was an amazing yeah. collaboration and mm -hmm. uh, it, he, he transformed, he really invented Broadway. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was the, the, the originating lyricist along with Jerome Kern, who, who he wrote over 250 songs with. And um, as the, the acerbic Dorothy Parker once said, um, she took over from Palmer's drama critic for Van Vanity Fair. Mm -hmm. And um, when he was at his height of fame with the musicals on Broadway, we had five musicals running simultaneously on Broadway in 1917. It's, it, it, it's a record has never been beaten. Mm -hmm. um, and she said of him that um, the first thing she did in the morning was to get up and sharpen her tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and she's considered um, Guy Bolton, who was the librettist, um, Plum, who wrote the lyrics, and Jerome Kern, who wrote most of the music to these, these big shows. Um, Dorothy Parker just said that, that the musicals were her favorite indoor sport. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you could see why, because um, in, in the early days of, as it were, Broadway, we had these Viennese big imports, big casts, 12 sets. And what Plum and Jerome Kern and Guy Bolton did at the Princess Theater, intimate little theater, they created real musical theatre. It was real drama. And it was something everyone could relate to. It's where the dialogue flowed effortlessly into the songs. And it was re real plays with music. Mm -hmm. And it was touching and beautiful. And I think the great revolution came in 1917, actually cut from a show called Oh Lady Lady, mm -hmm. his most famous song, Bill, mm -hmm. which found its way about 10 years later in the great blockbuster Showboat. Mm -hmm. um, but when Plum simply said, I love him because he's, I don't know, <laughs> because he's just my Bill. Mm -hmm. That was a little revolution, I think, <laughs> of saying how it was heartfelt and it was genuine. That's beautiful. So these were all done while he was in London. He hadn't gone to Hollywood yet, right? He hadn't gone to Hollywood. He, he, was, in, <coughs> he, he was the first transatlantic commuter, as you like <laughs> to say. Mm -hmm. So he spent a lot of time on ships going across the Atlantic where they would write their shows. Mm -hmm. And they, they would often write um, two, or, you know, two or three scenes or uh, an act as, uh, on the crossing or they'd uh, you know, tighten up the finale of act two or whatever. Right. But it was an amazing time that, that they spent traveling back and forth and working on these ships. So literally showboat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But his big thing was meeting um, Jerome Kern in, mm -hmm. in 1904 and then working with him, writing. He used to write the, the encore verses of the, the great shows at the time. And that's how he made his name. And they were always funny. He says of one, I think it's called Mr. Chamberlain in 1906 with Jerome Kern, that he wrote this wonderful song. And at the end, it got six encores, oh. his verse. <laughs> 
and, 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 and a great deal of room in the press. Mm -hmm. So he said, wow, this is fame. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's a really amazing, amazing time of transformation. Sure, yeah. Right, well, we'll come to Vikram now, <laughs> whose day job is being the High Commissioner here. <laughs> but Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> somebody's got to do it. Uh, but when he joined, the first thing he wanted to do was join the Woodhouse Society. So he sent in his letter, right? And they asked you to give a speech which went viral. Some of you here might have seen it, in which he said, Jeeves is Indian, of course, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> so tell us about that. Okay. Well, actually, um, I actually joined Woodhouse Society before coming here. Oh, OK. Oh. Um, and I wanted <laughs> to join it in Advanced my own personal planning. capacity. Yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and to my embarrassment, my office and my last assignment uh, followed it up with a formal letter saying, you know, His Excellency the High Commissioner wants to and so on and so forth. So I got this very formal response back. And mm -hmm. to my great embarrassment, it came as a formal response. So, <laughs> so I said, no, look, really, frankly, I actually want to join as me, not as <laughs> High Commissioner, because I'm not necessarily sure that this is mm -hmm. something that the government wants me to formally sign on. <laughs> so, you know, joining joining uh, book societies is not part of the mandate, <laughs> not necessarily, at least. But yes, uh, so being part of this uh, society, um, and I need to thank Tony Ring in particular. I believe he's here in the audience. For those of you who don't know, there he is. Uh, Tony is the greatest Woodhouse scholar going. And his stuff, mm -hmm. one of them is here. So any of you who is interested, he has books out, just as Paul next door does. So I'm doing their advertising. Mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially, anything you want to know about Woodhouse, you'll find it there. Um, so I got an opportunity to go and speak at the society at their annual event in February, I think it was, and I put forward what I thought was what would, you would consider a reasonable deduction, which okay. is that if you add it all together and the little clues that Plum puts out, including his, what I think should be a famous quotation, where he talks about Jeeves reminding him of those astral birds in India <laughs> who sort of dis disappear in one place only to reappear in another. Mm -hmm. And that he had a transcendentalist friend who tried to do this once, but couldn't, but perhaps because of the fact that he had eaten the flesh of an uh, animals slain in anger. <laughs> and that disappointment uh, prevented him from emulating Jeeves. Mm -hmm. But if Jeeves was the original in actually being able to do it, then it probably suggests that Jeeves was actually from up there. <laughs> like Victoria and Abdul. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he was we'll, Abdul to Bertie's Victoria. <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> right, so what is the fascination? I mean, his natural home is India, right, Jeeves? Because that's, they love him there. Why, why do Indians? And there's a lot of Indians here as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know, I know. South Asians, I won't just say Indians. I think he's loved across South Asia. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so well, why? Well, why? I have a couple of theories here and mm -hmm. I've, written down a small uh, <laughs> number of th theories on that. Okay, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, one of them, I think, is uh, the fact that he uh, essentially pre prefigured Bollywood in the sense, <laughs> in the sense of being a sentimentalist, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, quite frankly, he is a sentimentalist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's done with great good spirit. And, you know, the good guy and the good girl always win out. The proceeds of crime never actually take you very far. The criminals are usually largely inept, <laughs> and if not, they're quite endearing, you know, with the mm. exception of Chimp Twist, mm -hmm. a particularly <laughs> repulsive character. But <laughs> the rest of them are rather, rather likable criminals. And of course, most importantly, I'd say, you know, there is also the fact that he sticks to one large plot trope, you know, mm -hmm. boy meets girl, mm -hmm. boy gets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl again at the end. That's Bollywood, and, yeah, yeah. And that's Bollywood. <laughs> Leave out the songs, and yeah, the songs yeah. became Broadway. Yeah. So he just seg segregated the two. We just combined the two. <laughs> you see? So it seems logical to me to say that Bollywood, India, Woodhouse, yeah. there's a neat, neat, neat empathy around it. <laughs> but most of all, if mm -hmm. you see, with the exception of one or two stories, he never really tried to get out of that. Mm -hmm. And that's also like our music. You know, you have the raga form, <laughs> and you, in, you can do creativity within that. Mm -hmm. But you don't actually go outside the form. Right. Woodhouse did a few. He had, um, if, you, if those of you who remember, Laughing Gas. Laughing Gas is the one where he tries to experiment with the idea of um, souls getting crossed across into bodies. It's a terrific laugh, but clearly it was written in the 1950s when everybody was into alternative oh. lifestyles and transcendentalism and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But nothing that he really try, carries very far, far, far forward. Right. So, India again. Yep, <laughs> of course. <laughs> 
So coming to you, Paul, the expert who has written three volumes on three volume. on Wodehouse. Yeah. yeah. So you were allowed access to the archives. Absolutely. <laughs> which is yeah. a dream for anybody. I mean, speaking as a historian, of course. It was a real privilege, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, to get invited to the Caslett family home yes. down in, in uh, Sussex mm -hmm. and to go through these amazing scrapbooks that Hal's father, mm -hmm. uh, Edward, has uh, assembled of okay. uh, Woodhouse memorabilia and even down to sort of things he cut from American newspapers, little articles, little yeah. things about American slang. He was absolutely addicted to American slang. And they're all pasted in a beautiful order, oh. ready for someone like me to come and absolutely <laughs> you know, steal them all and oh. put them in a book. Brilliant. So, yeah, it was a fantastic experience. And was there anything that surprised you? Yeah, um, how, quite how hard Woodhouse used to work doing mm -hmm. his, his books. I mean, it's well known that he, um, he wrote about four times as much as he needed to for every book. So of, you know, 25% was kept, 75% ended up in a bin. Oh. And um, you, you can see, mm. looking through the scrapbooks, just how minutely he plotted and planned mm -hmm. and where he got his things from. Just, just a word here, a sentence there, a phrase there, and it slotted in and he made it fit beautifully. He was a master craftsman, wasn't he? Was, he? he was I mean, the best. The be he was the master. Evelyn Waugh said he Maybe, was yeah. better than James Joyce, even um, T.S. Eliot, at, <laughs> at actually assimilating mm -hmm. bits of literature mm -hmm. and making them his own. Wow. So, fabulous. yeah, and I totally agree. <laughs> right, Shashi, coming to you. You actually wanted to write to the master because you were um, the president. <coughs> of the Woodhouse Society of St. Stephen's College. Well, they're the first and oldest Woodhouse Society in the world, as I discovered, <laughs> Tony Ring will confirm. Uh, it predates the one in, the, in England. It was the one at St. Stephen's College. Mm -hmm. It was founded in the 60s by, uh, there, there's some dispute about ownership, so I won't name it, but <laughs> it had fallen into disuse when I, called, when I joined the college in 72. And so with a couple of friends, we got together and revived the society. Excellent. And we had a wonderful letterhead, complete mm. with curly-tailed pig, um, <laughs> the Empress. Empress uh, of Landis, and, yeah. and, you know, I, I became the president of the society. <laughs> and when I was elected president of the union, I was supposed to resign all my positions, but I refused to resign from this one. So uh, an accommodation was made, and I continued as president of the Woodhouse Society. Mm -hmm. But I was procrastinating over a letter to the master to tell him <laughs> that there was this unlikely outpost of Woodhouseiana uh, far away in, you know, <laughs> dusty Delhi. Um, and it, something, you know, you know, somebody, I think, was it War who said that, uh, 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 you know, writing something to Woodhouse would be like presenting a souffle to Bocuse or something. Or maybe maybe I thought it up. I can't remember. Was, but yeah, I felt it that was a reviewer way. in Punch, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, uh, to to, um, to criticise Woodhouse is like taking a spade to a souffle. Spade, spade to a souffle, to a souffle. Yeah. that was it. Yes. Yeah. So whatever it was, <laughs> it, it was never quite right enough. And I, so I never sent it. And then in February of 1974, five, I suppose, five, five, five. came the dreadful news that he passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, he was 94, so it shouldn't have been such a major shock at that time, but it still was because, as he said about his own stepdaughter, when she passed away, I thought she was immortal. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us who were reading Woodhouse assumed mm -hmm. he was immortal too. Absolutely. But I did get to address the Woodhouse Society here, and I think it was 2005. Mm -hmm. um, and they even made me a patron. I don't know if I still am. <laughs> correspondence has dried up over the years as I went back to Indian politics. Well, but, um, it can always be but, revived like the Woodhouse Society in Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, um, this was, I mean, your question to Vikram about why India. Mm -hmm. I love his Bollywood answer, which mm -hmm. hadn't occurred to me. But I thought one of the reasons that he did a appeal to India was there really was no sort of anxiety of allegiance in loving a British writer mm -hmm. who was supposed to be quintessentially English and yet who demanded no allegiance from the readers. I mean, the characters were, were stock, sort of theatrical personages. There was nothing uh, particularly about them. He, he was largely non-political, though he mm -hmm. took down the black shirts a bit and, mm -hmm. in Court of the Woosters and a couple of books in the 1930s. He um, had only one line about Mahatma Gandhi or anything to do with an <laughs> Indian nationalist movement in any of his books, and it was one which Let's he wanted me to yes, share with course. the audience, so I will. Yeah. Why is there unrest in India? It was a short story in 1935. Why is there unrest in India? Because its inhabitants eat only an occasional handful of rice. The day when Mahatma Gandhi sits down to a good juicy stick and follows it up with roly-poly pudding and a spot of stilton, you will see the end of all this nonsense of civil disobedience. <laughs> <laughs> but Indians saw that this comment was meant to elicit laughter and mm -hmm. actually not 
be taken terribly right. seriously. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we weren't expected to agree with it. <laughs> so I've often argued that the joy of Woodhouse was that you, you, you didn't need a visa to enter his world because it was a totally imaginary world that didn't exist for his English readers either. It was a never, never land. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you did need a passport, and that was the English language. <laughs> and the English language that he so delightfully subverted in so many ways. I mean, all these classical illusions we learned, I mean, as you know, research has established that the study of English literature was a gift of British colonialism. Nobody studied English literature until the English created the subject to overawe their colonial subjects in India. There are PhD theses on this, so I, <laughs> I stand on solid ground. So in the study of English literature, there were little Indians, you know, memorizing all the great lines of, British lit of English literature. Uh, and there you have Woodhouse subverting them cheerfully. Mm -hmm. All the great classical canons were sort of, you know, uh, made, made fun of in his allusions and his similes and his sure. references. Yeah. And so you ended up uh, feeling really complicit with him in, in mm -hmm. all of this without feeling in any way mm -hmm. that, that being an Indian somehow disqualified you from admission to his world. But just to, just to play devil's advocate a bit, um, you know, is, is, is it a colonial hangover that made people like us, you know, when you talk about the roly-poly pudding and the clubs, is it a little bit of that in India, that, you know, that nostalgia for the, you know, that world a little bit? I don't <laughs> agree with that. that I know that's, that, that's a theory. There was a, mm -hmm. a big essay on, on, on this, uh, which I, I, I wrote a somewhat angry piece reacting to, going back to <laughs> 1988 when somebody took the line that Indians are the last Englishmen and that's why they hold on to. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, uh, in my own experience, I mean, I was married to the granddaughter of the nationalist leader, Kailash Nath Karju, and when he was uh, governor uh, of, I've forgotten which state, I think either Bengal or Orissa, he'd been both. One of those, Manbatten, came to stay with him, mm -hmm. and Manbatten needed something to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother-in-law to be introduced him to P.G. Woodhouse. The Indian nationalist had a collection of P.G. Woodhouse. The British Viceroy had never heard or had never read it. <laughs> Seriously? So, you know, the that politics of this yeah, don't yeah. suggest that uh, okay. there's any nostalgia for the colonial connection. <laughs> right. They saddled us with the language, and boy, we loved subverting them with it. <laughs> we did. I mean, who could beat, you know, a character like Gussie Pigmantle? I mean, exactly. You, it, like people say, you want to relax, which I do. Sometimes you just want to relax, you pick up a P.G. Woodhouse and just get into the language and the fun. And you're in a different world. So there is actually a point about erudition and about what uh, Evelyn Waugh calls uh, Swifties, if I remember right. Nifties, sorry. Nifties. Nifties. These are absolutely brilliant because Nifties are essentially the way Woodhouse created almost one new simile, pretty much sometimes per page. It was absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. There's this description which I wrote down from Uncle, yeah. Uncle Fred in the springtime. The Duke's moustache was rising and falling like seaweed on an ebb tide. The, this is the Duke of Dunstable who has a habit of harumphing into his moustache. And the erudition, when he describes Beach in one of his early introductions to Beach, mm -hmm. you know, you sort of subvert erudition and Shakespeare, as you mm -hmm. particularly said, uh, Shashi. Julius Caesar, who liked to have men about him who were fat, would have taken to him at once. <laughs> so, you know, you have to go back all the way to the original line where he talks about lean and, hun lean and hungry. Mm -hmm. You know, Cassius has a, there, Yon Cassius yeah. has a yeah, lean yeah, and hungry yeah, look. Yeah. And he subverted that. Yeah. Or the butler was looking nervous, like Macbeth interviewing Lady Macbeth after one of her visits to the spare room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's brilliant. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> you got a few more up there? I see oh, yes, I've got lots. Okay, one from you, and then I'll move to Hal. <laughs> One Gosh, I don't know which ones I should. Uh, my, one okay. of my favorites okay. of all time has to be this one. Um, since, you know, we were a country ruled for the better part of two centuries by the dispensable products of the British nobility. Uh, <laughs> 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 so that's me, not Woodhouse, but listen to Woodhouse. <laughs> but equally worth a clap. <laughs> Unlike the male codfish, which suddenly finding itself the parent of 3,500,000 little codfish, cheerfully resolves to love them all, the British aristocracy is apt to look with a somewhat jaundiced eye on its younger sons. <laughs> and they send them off to India, of course. <laughs> That's about Freddie Threepwood. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, gosh. So, Hal, um, he, um, what else, becomes the first person, the first English author to be actually wooed actively by Hollywood. He is invited there. But he spends, I have this lovely line from him, which I'm going to read. <laughs> Um, he spends a lot of time swimming rather than writing, and he writes, I get up, 
swim, then breakfast, right till two, swim again, work till seven, swim for the third time, <laughs> then dinner and the day is over. It's really rather jolly. The actual work is negligible. <laughs> <laughs> it's extraordinary, isn't it? Um, he, so he went to Hollywood at the end of the um, 20s. So he was in Hollywood in 1930. And um, he's working I under contract at MGM to the mighty Sam Goldwyn. Mm -hmm. And Sam Goldwyn, incidentally, um, was exactly Plum's contemporary. Mm -hmm. And um, before 1917, he was actually called Sam Goldfish. Oh. <laughs> and he didn't think the name was serious enough. And so he got his name officially changed to Goldwyn. Oh. And suddenly he started running this incredibly successful movie studio that everyone looked up to. So Plum went and worked for him and he was very, very wealthy. And he was also famously mean. And um, Plum recounts going onto one of his um, yachts at an MGM party and said something like, um, it was one of those toe curling parties where the champagne flowed like glue. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! I mean, it's just so good. Um, so yes, so um, to go back to your, your 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 point about Woodhouse working in Hollywood, I mean, here's a man that that, that ge his genius comes to the fore when he's on his own, mm. or he's having a little walk with Guy Bolton and talking about scenarios and plots for books, which. Um, were, were very troubling to him because they, they're hard getting, as we all know, getting plots or stories for anything. So he, but he was brilliant at it and he used to sellotape lots of bits of paper together and put them in drawers when he had a character. And um, so he, he, he was, was very much left um, on his own, swimming lengths of a swimming pool. But also he w had to work with eight collaborators. There was one that did the scenario there was one that came in to work on preliminary dialogue. There was the next one that came in to work on a, a plot structure. Mm. And then there were, there were two others that came in to work on character. And, they inserted, and then they gave it to Plum at the end to work on um, class and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to insert class and whatnot. And then the real scenario writers would arrive and then alter the plot and the whole thing would go round in circles again. Mm. So that's what ha really happened. It was a disenchanting time. He didn't, he didn't feel at all um, uh, comfortable in Hollywood. He didn't get much produced. That was the problem. And yeah. that really frustrated a creative person. Right. And uh, he was interviewed as a sort of exit interview um, by one of the Hollywood magazines. And he basically said, totally disingenuously, you know, they pay me 2,000 bucks a week and I don't really earn it. And immediately, he said that in all innocence, and immediately the auditors came in, the accountants <laughs> came in, and, 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 and basically fired hundreds of people in MGM. Oh. So he was kind of persona non grata for a little while in Hollywood. Goodness, but goodness. Oh. I did see one uh, of, the, of the film, it was a Jeeves, Jeeves film. It was dreadful because the, the, the people chained the plot. And, and yeah. so <laughs> it begins like a Woodhouse narrative, and David Niven was Bertie Wooster, one of his oh. very first films. Yeah. And, um, and, and Jeeves um, tells it, but then they suddenly brought in German spies and a mystery and betrayal and so and then some slapstick and uh -huh. it was it was a, a disaster of a film uh -huh. uh, after the first few minutes of Woodhouse. Clearly he'd written the original and then they just completely mangled it. And then but they, they kept the name Jeeves and so on. So. Yeah, they got in the second film they got rid of Bertie completely and it was what? just Jeeves on his own. Oh. And they, they, in that first <laughs> film they were joined <laughs> they were actually joined by um, a saxophone player <laughs> who would just they That's couldn't right. shake off all the way through the film. You think, what what has this got to do with Woodhouse? But absolutely yeah. nothing. But you know they did get some Woodhouse did get some value out of it. Mm -hmm. There are some, there is well, his own separate sets of, apart from the $2,000, <laughs> uh, but there are these separate sets of short stories that he based in Hollywood mm -hmm. that are fantastically funny. Yeah. They are. And you know, it's a little known bit about Woodhouse because everybody reads mm -hmm. obviously the Jeeves and Wooster stories mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. um, Blanding's Castle mm -hmm. stories. But the short stories set in, uh, set in Hollywood mm -hmm. are also spectacularly funny. Mm -hmm. um, right. There's one of, there's one of, they're called the Mulliners of Hollywood and they're yes. grouped together in a, a 1935 volume, I think. Oh. And uh, there's one of them where um, there's a gorilla on the loose. In, yes. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is before <laughs> King Kong comes out. There's a gorilla on the loose in the back lot of the, of the film studio. And uh, there's, there's a guy, one of the Mulliners, who's broken up with his, uh, his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. uh, and he basically is, doesn't want to live anymore. And he approaches the gorilla, and it turns out that the gorilla 
um, says, uh, oh, hello. <laughs> um, and it turns out um, he's a, a, a scholar of Magdalen College, Oxford. Uh, in, a, valiant, uh, valiant, valiant. <laughs> in a monkey suit, which has cost him a fortune. He hangs oh, around the lot waiting for, 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 for to, to, to be cast Aww. in films. And so Mulliner, he, 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 he basically says, you know, he, I'll just lead you down and say I've captured you and I'll get the heart of my girl again. Which is what he does. <laughs> and he's a hero. <laughs> and it's, it's an absolutely gorgeous story, but there's five stories, yes. all of which, as you say, Vikram, are fantastic. And a little the rise of Nordstrom. Yeah, Minna Nordstrom is wonderful. So, Hal, I mean, how much did you, you never met him, of course. Uh, but I never met him. But uh, what are the family, you know, give us a little few anecdotes. Um, well, he, he died, in, obviously, in 1975. Um, I knew my great-grandmother, Ethel, his widow. Mm -hmm. um, I went, uh, did two visits to Long Island. There was one wonderful moment that, that stays very, very um, sharply in my mind. As a kid, we, was, we sat around the table in the Woodhouse's uh, main living room, which sort of attached to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting around in flip-flops and T-shirts and sort of having our burgers and, and our, <laughs> our Cokes. And I shall never forget that descending down the staircase mm -hmm. came my great-grandmother, Ethel, in sequins... <laughs> high heel shoes, <laughs> pearl necklace, and a feather boa. <laughs> and she walked down the stairs, and my father took one look at her because he told her that it was dinner time. <laughs> and she made her entrance into the main living room. Oh, wow. <laughs> and as she put her hand out like that, my father placed a martini in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Dance for a song. Shall, okay. we, shall we have another? A little quick song. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here are two very, very short songs from 1928 and 1930. The first with lyrics by Plum, and the second with lyrics by Plum and Ira Gershwin. And the composer for both these songs, well, they were working on a show called Miss 1917 at the time, and they had this pianist, this, this gangly pianist, in the corner playing piano for the rehearsals. And Plum had a very, very busy day that day. And he went up to him and said, listen, old boy, um, we haven't met. My name's Plum Woodhouse. I've done the lyrics to this thing. What's your name? And this hand comes up and, the, and he just says, my name's George Gershwin. Mm. Mm. I have a brother, Ira. Can we write songs together? <laughs> and so that was the beginning of, 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 of their friendship and their collaboration. So here we go. Yep, yeah, oh, but isn't love great? Gee whiz. Hey ho, I'm willing to state it is. Don't know who that chap was who first began it, but it's the only thing on this planet. Oh, gee, oh, joy, the birds are singing. Because why? Because I am in love. Oh, gee, oh, joy. The bells are ringing Because why? Because I am in love And all the while I seem in a dream I never was so happy Folks complain I'm insane Because I act so sappy Oh gee, oh joy The birds are singing Because why? Because I am in love I got rhythm I got music I got my girl who could ask for anything more I got daisies in green pastures I got my girl who could ask for anything more And all the while I seem in a dream I never was so happy Folks complain I'm insane Because I act so sappy Oh gee oh joy The birds are singing Because why? Because why? Because I am in love. Who could ask for anything more? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was given a plaque in Westminster. I think. Yes. And but it came with some. Uh, press that said he shouldn't be there before it was installed. You were there at the I picture. was there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But before it was installed, there was a little bit of press saying, you know, 
he was uh, anti-Semitic, he shouldn't be there, etc. So I wonder, Paul, if you'd just like to, was he, was it, is there anything in the books that mentions it or was it just um, comments he made about Jews? Well, it's obviously what a very happens? serious matter and mm -hmm. um, I don't think we're really in the mood to be serious. No, no, no. So I'll deal with it very quickly. Sure, um, sure. If, you, mm -hmm. if you want to go into this, um, mm -hmm. there's a member of the American um, Woodhouse Society called Elliot Milstein, who is himself Jewish mm -hmm. and is a great Woodhouse scholar. And he has literally read all the books several times and gone through them with a fine tooth comb and produced a wonderful piece of scholarship, which will clue you in on this. Mm -hmm. And basically his findings, if I was to sum them up, are there's nothing to see here. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, all we need to say about that. Happy. <laughs> And, and as Shashi discovered in all those, there was only one reference and a pretty sweet reference to Gandhi. So. I mean, there were assorted minor characters who served in the Indian army, but there's nothing yeah, very there much about nothing, they yeah. did And there's always a dodgy curry, because there has to be a dodgy <laughs> curry, but that's, <laughs> that's sort of it. Um, so well, while we're on the subject of political correctness, et cetera, I mean, there is this whole movement now to rewrite yeah. books by Roald Dahl, and, you know, in Enlightened and Christie have already been rewritten. So I just wanted your views on this. Should they be? Should we leave Roald Dahl alone? Should we correct him? What yeah, should we, we should do? leave Woodhouse alone, and apparently he's being rewritten too. Huh? Some of his early um, uh, stuff set in America had references to black people that uh, mm -hmm. are deemed incorrect today. But I, I think the folly of all this is, first of all, writers have to be read in the context in which they wrote and the times in which they wrote. Mm -hmm. uh, it's obvious from anyone who surveys Woodhouse's work that the man was not malicious about anybody or anything. He was incapable of malice, mm -hmm. not even to his German captors in yes. World, yeah. World War II. Yes, got him into trouble too. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's clear that he was using language that at the time was considered appropriate. So, at the worst, what you could do is you could have a little disclaimer on the copyright page of any new edition mm -hmm. saying that the reader is warned that there may be terms here that might appear to be offensive. But to actually rewrite an author after his death seems to me completely bizarre. I mean, the Baudelaire did that to Shakespeare, you remember? Mm -hmm. uh, all the, the sort of double entendres and, and wicked lines uh, were taken out. There were entire new editions of Shakespeare that in fact, were prescribed in India as too. It was the A.E. Bodler edition, Bodlerized editions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I don't think we need to Bodlerize 20th century authors. It's, mm -hmm. it's foolish to do that. I mean, to be fair to his publishers, they, are, they, they have announced what they're going to be cutting out, and it is basically two words. Oh. So out of 10 million that he wrote, mm -hmm. that's not a bad <laughs> average, really. Um, not at all. No. So well done. It's, well done, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> But it, it's two, two words in one book, I think, in the in exactly, Indiscretions yeah. of Archie, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it? it's mm -hmm. in the Indiscretions of Archie. But it's also in Thank You, Jeeves. Thank and you, Jeeves. in Leave It exactly. to Smith. Uh, and in Leave It to Smith, yeah. But it's the same word. So, <laughs> yes. you know, okay. you can guess which one. We'll, yeah, exactly. we'll leave we that there. Yeah. To go into that. Right, right. So, Vikram, tell me, I mean, this next generation in India, I mean, we're the oldies here. We loved Woodhouse. What's happening to the next generation? Are they following? I mean, it's a generation of startups and, you know, I don't know what. Well, <laughs> so many know, new I'm things. I'm flattered by the compliment, but I think you're. <laughs> Probably asking the wrong person, <laughs> age-wise. <laughs> but, but yes, I think I think there's a fair point there. Um, I think there is there is uh, there is a there is a question about who's reading Woodhouse now and how relevant will he be. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we need we need to have the patience to see that. I mean, uh, frankly, I was six when P. G. Woodhouse passed away. It's not like it stopped me from picking up. A Woodhouse book because this was an author that was mm -hmm. no more, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I think newer generations can be introduced to Woodhouse by making it accessible. You know, if you give them this vast library of 90 books, it's not 95, 95 <laughs> books. It's not the easiest way of making an introduction to an author. But, but if you pick them up with, with short stories and stuff like that, the other is to make them actually seem relevant. And um, mm -hmm. to Paul's point, actually, I have this another thesis, which is that he's also actually, in many senses, quite a modern author. You know, Something Fresh was his first Blanding's novel, mm -hmm. written in 1915, 15, correct, Paul? Uh, he has a character there who specifically is feminist. <laughs> and essentially, if you see all his writing, mm -hmm. he is very mm -hmm. modern in the way he treats, uh, treats women. Very much unlike the rest of his time. So you can actually make Woodhouse accessible mm -hmm. to a modern generation by actually pointing out why he's not 
you know, from some little frozen world in the 1920s. Sure, sure, yeah. Tyrannical aunts, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's reasonable. We, we, uh, you know, we're repositories uh, of power. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> rather than being, you know, cowed down uh, yeah, yeah. aunts. And we all have tyrannical aunts, don't and, we? And, yeah, I mean, it's such a thing. Strong men would climb up trees and pull them, <laughs> pull, pull them after them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, right. No, I mean, it's... Uh, go, go on. It, sorry. <laughs> no, I've been told five minutes. So I'm, I'm just... To, five minutes to questions, Sharupa? Yeah, OK. So I have five minutes more. To, um, yeah, read a few extracts or give us your favorite quotes, maybe. <laughs> sure. No, I, I just want to say something about Before the, we open the, the, it to the question you asked, Vikram, which is that yeah, yeah. 20 years ago, I actually did an essay on this in The Guardian. OK. Um, I think my title was the right ho sahib or something, and theirs was how the Woosters conquered Delhi. <laughs> but at that point, uh, as my inquiries established, Woodhouse was still uh, a popular. In fact, the Washington Post for Michael Derda done an essay saying that in America, Woodhouse is a cult author now mm -hmm. and no longer a popular author. Oh. And I said that is simply not true in India, where, um, of course, no English writer commands a mass audience anymore, not mm -hmm. even Agatha Christie. But um, if you talk to the British Council librarians, for example, at that time, 20 mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. um, they would tell you that it, you know, they had to stock multiple copies of every new Woodhouse reprint mm -hmm. and announce them proudly amongst the new arrivals, and they were the ones that got snapped up first. Yeah. You could buy Woodhouse books at railway stations. Even now. Absolutely. Even, Even now. now. And so airports too. And airports everywhere. and so on. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that kind of wide readership is there, but whether the, the younger generation is reading very much at all for pleasure is the bigger worry. I mean, I think both Vikram and I would have discovered Woodhouse in school mm -hmm. or in, in our school days, whereas... Um, Today, I, I increasingly come across school children in India who seem to think that books only relate to schoolwork and homework. And yes. they are not, the, the, the idea of reading for pleasure um, is beginning to, to fade. And that worries me, not just for Woodhouse, but for all for uh, general, serious yeah. writing yeah, yeah, um, yeah. in any case. Right. Favorite quotes. Well, another yeah. one that I wanted to share was, <laughs> She resembled one of those engravings of the mistresses of Bourbon kings, <laughs> which make one feel that the monarchs who selected them must have been men of iron, impervious to fear, or else, or else short-sighted. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one for an author, if I may. It has been well said that an author who expects results from a first novel is in a position similar to that of a man who drops a rose petal down the Grand Canyon and listens for the echo. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking of um, whether, whether Woodhouse is up to date or not, um, I actually used a Woodhouse quote on a train in, uh, uh, a, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. I was uh, trained to Oxford. It was very crowded, um, very few seats available. I saw one, plonked myself down next to this guy, and he said, I wish you wouldn't sit there. <laughs> and I said, well, why not? <laughs> And, and he said, well, I'm, I'm reading my book and I don't like to be crowded. Ooh. And I was like, right, OK. Um, and this gentleman, in a perfect Edinburgh accent, then went to say, well, that's typical of you younger people, which I'm very flattered by. Um, you're so selfish. I said, well, you haven't got the immortal crust to say that I'm being selfish when you are demanding that I vacate my seat simply so that you can read your book. Anyway, big gentleman happened to be from north of the border, and I said to him, quote, unquote, it is never difficult to distinguish between a Scotsman with a grievance and a ray of sunshine. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> <laughs> Which witnessed the collapse of the Stout Party. And, uh, and here's a political one for you. Uh, this is from our man in America, since we talked about how much America influenced him. And here's this, he had these little things in... Plum pie, mm -hmm. a lovely, a lovely, uh, I lovely I love collection. That edition, this one's falling apart, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, well Those are the well best thumbed. ones. <laughs> so this lady um, discovers that she she puts some towels in her automatic clothes dryer, <laughs> and um, before she was called to the telephone, and she had not been talking long before a suspicion floated into her mind that something was amiss. I glanced at the dryer, she told the reporter, and I saw this white thing going round and round, and I knew I hadn't put anything white there, just brown towels. <laughs> So she opened the door, and there was her cat, Murphy, doing, <laughs> like a South American rep republic, 60 revolutions to the minute. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. That's brilliant. Brilliant. I've got, oh, that's brilliant. I've got one, uh, but, uh, since we've been talking about aunts. Uh, the, 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 aunt, the aunt that Bertie did get on with um, was Aunt Dahlia, whom he said was not to be confused with Aunt Agatha, Agatha, who eats broken bottles and is strongly suspected of turning into a werewolf at the time of the full moon. 
Aunt Dahlia, he remarked, was as good a sort as ever to say tally-ho to a fox. If she ever turned into a werewolf, it would be one of those jolly, breezy werewolves <laughs> who, who would be a pleasure to meet. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> For a literary festival, I don't know how many people here still have heard of or have read G.K. Chesterton, but mm -hmm. if anyone knows what he looks like, mm -hmm. <laughs> here's a line from a Woodhouse novel. The yes, drowsy yes, stillness of the afternoon was shattered by what sounded to his strained senses like G.K. Chesterton falling on a sheet of tin. <laughs> 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 or when really? Bertie says to Jeeves, sometimes mm -hmm. I wonder if trousers matter. <laughs> and, and Jeeves says, the mood will pass. So. <laughs> 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 Brilliant. So, before we open it to uh, audience, um, I just want to ask you your favourites, Jeeves versus Wooster or Blandings, one by one? Uh, I think Sunset oh. at Blandings. Ah, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Shashi? No, the, the earlier Blandings books. Actually, uh, Leave it to Smith, I think, had, had both Blandings and Smith in it. Yes, yeah. that was my favourite, absolutely. Oh, okay. I think, I think, <laughs> but, you know, it's very difficult to pick one. It's very one. difficult. I know, I'm I, being unfair. I, I love most of them. <laughs> yeah. Hot water, heavy weather. <laughs> oh, heavy weather is <laughs> brilliant. Um, I'm, I'm a Jeeves and Worcester man myself, although, of course, mm -hmm. I like them more. Okay. Um, but uh, the mating season's my favourite. Mm. If only for the, <laughs> the absolutely masterful. Right in the middle, there's mm -hmm. a... You have an extract yes. from there. Uh, I actually have a, an extract from... Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is actually from a pelican at Blandings, which yeah. is 1969. Mm -hmm. Plum was 88, 89 when he wrote this, and he was still firing on all cylinders. This is the end of the book when Lord Emsworth and his brother Galley have managed to dispatch their sort of tyrannical sister off to America so that they, they can breathe out again, and they're having a, a dinner on a summer evening in Blandings. Yes. Another day was drawing to a close, and dusk had fallen once more on Blandings Castle. The Empress had turned in. Chauffeur Vools was playing his harmonica. The stable cat was having a quick wash and brush up before starting on its night out. And in the kitchen, Mrs. Willoughby, the cook, was putting the finishing touches on the well-jammed roly-poly pudding, which Beach would soon be taking to the library, where Galley and Lord Emsworth were enjoying their dinner of good, plain English fare. Now that they were alone, Lord Emsworth had said, it was cosier there than in the vast salon where the meal had been served during the reign of Lady Constance. Through the open window, the scent of stocks and tobacco plant floated in, competing with the aroma of the leg of lamb, the boiled potatoes and the spinach, with which dinner had begun. Beach brought in the roly-poly pudding and withdrew, and Lord Emsworth heaved a contented sigh. His toes wriggled sensuously inside his bedroom slippers. <laughs> <laughs> this is very pleasant, Galahad, he said, and Galahad endorsed his comment. I was thinking the same thing, Clarence. Peace, perfect peace, with loved ones far away, as one might say. <laughs> And now we want something to bring down the curtain. A toast is indicated. Let us drink to the Pelican Club, under whose gentle tuition I learn to keep cool, stiffen the upper lip, and always think a shade quicker than the other man. To the Pelican Club, said Galley, <laughs> raising his glass. Um, to the Pelican Club, said Lord Emsworth, raising his. What is the Pelican Club, Galahad? <laughs> God bless you, Clarence, said Galley. Have some more roly-poly pudding. Oh. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you. So we'll, we'll take a few questions. I think I have about five minutes. So make, make them short. And... Well, I have one, so I don't know, Hannah, if you have any thoughts. Agatha Christie's translated to the screen fairly well multiple times. Still is. Plum is never translated. Like, what do you think? I mean, not... Definitely not with the same level of success. So, mm -hmm. your thoughts on why that? I, I, I would say that um, I'm not sure I'm really allowed to say this, but I'm going to risk it. <laughs> in that I had heard through my family channels, I hope this answers your question, <laughs> is that Plum had always said that he never wanted his novels to leave the covers of his books. It's very difficult putting Woodhouse onto the screen because you lose the narrative, the wonderful turn of phrase, these wonderful similes. It's, the language is, is so mm. unique to him. And that, it's sort of sacred in that way, and that's his genius. And we had a Blandings series, which um, was very enjoyable for my children, because it got them reading the Blandings books. Why? Because it was all focused on the slapstick. 
slipping on banana skins, doing all this sort of stuff. So it was very much, um, it was taken out of context, I think, but I think that's why it's never really, truly worked. Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie were brilliant as Jeeves and Bertie. Oh, yeah. And there's a wonderful yeah. thing that Stephen Fry said, that you know, we were not going to touch it when they were asked. Mm -hmm. And so um, someone said, well, why? Because um, it's, it's, as I've said, it's the sort of sacred material, it won't, won't work. But then he said, well, we're going to have to do it. <laughs> But why? Because we can't let anyone else do it. <laughs> <laughs> right and they were brilliant. They were the only it people who could absolutely. approximate what Jeeves and Wooster would have been like. There was a very poor series attempted earlier. Yes, which was terrible. Seventy is terrible. Uh, but uh, Laurie and Fry are good. But as, as, as Hal said, you lost all the writing, all the narrative, mm -hmm. all those brilliant similes. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you do? Wood has writes it, he groaned slightly and winced, mm -hmm. like Prometheus watching his vulture dropping in for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> now, on screen, you'll show somebody groan slightly and wince, but you won't, sh you, you won't have that illusion, rest. right? Yeah. So all of this is... There's just too much lost, mm -hmm. so you'll, you'll only always get a fraction of the pleasure. In fact, in Doordarshan in the 1980s, it converted Blanding's castle into the, into the Rajasthani palace of an indolent Maharaj and did a Hindi version. Oh, no. It flopped <laughs> disastrously. Oh, dear. They never tried it again. With good reason. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, oh, so it doesn't translate terribly well on screen, doesn't translate terribly well to other languages. You really have to mm -hmm. enjoy it mm -hmm. this way. Right. So there's a question there. That was, oops, sorry. Oh, that was thoroughly enjoyable. Um, this is a question to uh, both Shashi as well as uh, Vikram. I mean, when I came in from India to the UK, uh, my idea of London and England was so influenced by what I'd read from PG Woodhouse <laughs> that I half expected that stealing policemen's helmets was a crime. <laughs> and people said toodaloo and pip pip to each other. <laughs> you know, these are the kind of uh, impressions I had. Now, <laughs> the, uh, and of course, a lot of those were uh, different experiences altogether, but I'm interested the way both of you looked at it. When you came into London and England for the first time, you know, given such, um, you're such Wodowsian fans, what, <laughs> you know, what, what did you see and perceive from that world and what was different? Any thoughts on that? You made the same mistake that the Germans made in 1940 when they were preparing <laughs> for the invasion of Britain. <laughs> they actually thought that, uh, that, that the Brits were, as in Woodhouse, in fact, somebody told them a quintessential English writer and so on. So their intelligence read up on Woodhouse. And the first spies they parachuted into Britain were arrested within minutes because they were wearing spats. <laughs> <laughs> and they were saying things like toodaloo and pip pip. <laughs> <laughs> Tinker tea tonk. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the fact is, the Woodhouse world didn't really exist. If at all, it existed briefly in. So the first decade of the 20th century, Edwardian England, maybe in, in aspects of it, but a lot of it was his imagination, his wit, his humour. Do you know there are 1,956 words in the Oxford English Dictionary that were coined by Woodhouse, created by Woodhouse? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and many of them would, would, would astonish us today when you realise that no one had used them before. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he had come up with them, and that includes some Americanisms. Uh, Rani Gazoo is a Woodhouse invention. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. during his Hollywood phase. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, I think those of us who, who read enough of him and about him probably realized that this was, this was an, a world of the imagination. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine a village really called Matcham Scratchings? <laughs> 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 Actually, somewhere. I can, because there are a fair number of strangely <laughs> named <laughs> villages <laughs> here. <laughs> like Nether Wallop, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lower and Upper Slaughter. <laughs> 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 So, you know, I mean, in a sense, yes, there is a sense that you wish the, uh, England was a bit like Woodhouse. It certainly would make my job a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I can assure you that, um, I mean, I'm reasonably confident that I can speak for both of us when I say neither of us really came here expecting to be pinching policemen's hats. <laughs> <laughs> on boat race night. <laughs> oh, on boat race night. Oh. So, I think... Um... Is there one the, the, more we can take? Trump. Lady in the front. Uh, right. Lady in front. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> one and then two. And then um, after that, we're going to wrap up. We just make it difficult for you by making shorts in the corners. <laughs> <laughs> just take both the questions together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, there is a small, commu small community on the internet which writes P.J. Woodhouse fan fiction. Which is some, which is something that well, young people mm -hmm. tend.
tend to read a lot and wh- and just my question is then what do you all of course think about that in terms of making pg woodhouse more accessible and reintroducing us at least my generation to pg woodhouse hmm. and we take, take the second yeah 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 second question mike PG Woodhouse has a big following in uh, Pakistan Mm -hmm. and whenever my husband read PG uh, PG Woodhouse in bed, I had to leave the room because the bed would start shaking. The fan club, if we take that. Yeah. Now, the internet's um, an interesting place, for, certainly for somebody who's writing about Woodhouse, because you know, there's, there's a lot of recycled opinion in the world of Woodhouse scholarship. And the internet is one place where you can actually get one or two interesting new angles on things. And for my book here, um, <laughs> uh, I actually now. conducted a, a, a small survey um, um, among Facebook fan groups, Woodhouse uh, fan groups. And what these fan groups tend to do, and I have to say most of their members do tend to be in South Asia, um, they swap Woodhouse quotes with one another. It's like cigarette cards like we used to in, back in the day, you know, or bubblegum cards or whatever. They just swap Woodhouse quotes and their nifties and their favourites with one another. And so they're actually improving their linguistic skills. They're actually... Um, doing something, they're, they're making each other laugh, uh-huh. um, and I would like to think that they're building a new community of, of Woodhouse fans. Um, so I can only say that it's positive. That's great. Uh, Christopher Hitchens and I did spent an entire dinner one night in, in, in Washington or New York, <laughs> swapping quotes <laughs> across the table to the consternation of the other guests. Oh gosh! <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Brilliant. he was, he was one. And he, you know, you don't expect him to be a Woodhouse fan, but he was. He absolutely, was, was, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, you've really got to come to it through the master's original works. And, and the thing is that there's just so much to dip into. It almost doesn't matter which book you pick up first. And I think see, see how, how much you enjoy it. But I would like to say that that's an interesting angle to come into it from. Um, you know, obviously, it's been we're coming on almost to 50 years since uh, P.G. Woodhouse passed on. But there have been a couple of interesting efforts to, with the permission of the estate, mm-hmm. uh, to come up with... Uh, new mm. homages to P.G. Woodhouse, if you will. Mm-hmm. And it's great if young people want to try and experiment with it. I'm not sure it's necessarily legal mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the estate permission, etc. But if it leads people into the world of Woodhouse, why not? Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, both these... Just the as long two, as you don't commercialise it. The, the two yeah. books are, are enjoyable, but not a, ma- not a patch on the original. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Perhaps we let him with the song? Yes. Yeah, and perhaps yeah. artificial intelligence might come up with a Woodhouse novel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, what a horrible Absolutely. thought. <laughs> uh, yes, we're going to wrap up this delightful session. If we tell us he can only use words he's actually used. Yes. <laughs> mm. uh, with yeah. so and Simon. <laughs> here's, yes, here's, I'd like to end with a song written over 100 years ago, um, which I think it's Plum and Jerome Kern, and... I think it echoes those immortal words uh, of Evelyn Waugh, who simply said, Plum was the master of my profession, who gave us all a world to live and delight in. Dear old songs forgotten too soon, They had their day, and then we threw them away. And without a sigh, we would pass them by for some other newer tune. So off to a happier home they flew, where they're always loved and they're always new. It's a land of flowers and April showers with sunshine in between, with roses blowing and rivers flowing, mid rushes growing. no one hurries 
and no one worries and life runs calm and slow and I wish someday I could find my way to the land where the good songs go and I wish Someday I could find my way to the land where the good songs go.